Unsiloed podcast is produced by University FM, elevating the stories of your institution. Welcome to Unsiloed. This is Greg LeBlanc, and I'm here today with Nick Epley, who is a professor of behavioral science at the University of Chicago Booth School of Business, also the author of this book, uh, MindWise, How We Understand What Others Think, Believe, Feel, and Want. And of course, I think this is about 10 years old. So since then, you, you've done an incredible amount of uh, research on what we might call miscalibrated social cognition. I guess that's kind of your thing, mm-hmm. uh, along with a lot yeah. of co-authors like Amit Kumar and Juliana Schroeder, my colleague, and uh, Juan Zhao and, and others. Um, welcome, Nick. Thanks so much for having me, Greg. This is gonna this is gonna be fun. I am working on another book, by the way. Um, my gray hair shows that that's what's happening. Um, it's a stressful process, but I'm I'm getting there. Yeah. Well, I mean, the the thing about most of your work is that you're focusing on what we might otherwise refer to as a sixth sense or or a superpower, right? Which mm-hmm. is this idea of of social cognition. And, and I think a lot of the folks who are doing cognition work. Uh, and a lot of the folks who in the behavioral economics who are focusing on cognitive work, th- they're focusing more on our relationship with the world, right? Like understanding mm-hmm. the, the probability that you're going to make money from this or that or mm-hmm. the probability that you're going to succeed in this or that in- endeavor. But, mm-hmm. I mean, most of our cognition in a way, I mean, I wouldn't say most, but a big chunk of our cognition and what makes us different from other animals is the the social aspect right i think some evolutionary biologists say that the reason for our big brain (laughs) is because we've we've got to figure out how to navigate this world where we have all of these other super smart creatures that we need to cooperate with or 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 compete with and so Mm -hmm. i think part of your work is to highlight how amazing we are at reading other people's minds and how this superpower is something that operates under the surface unbeknownst to us as, as we um, utilize it. But then another big part of your research is to highlight how it, we could do it better, right? And how, mm-hmm. you know, we, we make a lot of uh, mistakes with respect to evaluating uh, other people. So, um, you know, which part of your work do you think is more important? <laughs> the the hi- highlighting the, the strengths or, or uh, emphasizing the weaknesses? Because on, on the one hand, right, since you're in a business school, you're both engaged in descriptive work and prescriptive work, not just yeah. telling us how things operate, but kind of telling yeah. us how to operate things better. Yep, yep. That was a, a great description of our work. And I think these, these two orientations towards how we do anything, any activity, whether it's thinking about the minds of others or juggling bowling pins or whatever it might be, right, is going to be, if we're going to understand this effectively and understand how to do whatever it is we're trying to do a little better, we're both going to have to figure out how is it we do this thing in the first place. Because if you understand all of those mechanisms, the things that allow us to, say, think about somebody else, then you're also going to be able to understand where it falls a little bit short. Um, and there's just no there's just no doubt whatsoever that what makes us really special and unique on this planet is our capacity to think about the minds of others. And compared to, to other, you know, our nearest primate relatives, we're phenomenally good at this. We can do second and third order social cognition. So I can think about what you're thinking about what I might be thinking and use that to guide how I interact towards you. We can do this really well. We can think about what groups of people think, right? Aggregate across an entire group of people, if I show you a picture of a group of people that are showing a particular emotional expression, you can get a pretty good sense of how happy that group looks on average just by quickly glancing at it. I mean, we're really good at this. However, we're also imperfect at it. And that gap between you know our capacity and what we might be able to do, how good we could do, that's where wisdom comes, right? That's where we can, we have the opportunity to do a little bit better than we might otherwise. And I think that's where our value as behavioral scientists or psychologists studying how we do what we do. Um, that's where the value is. So of those two things, what's more valuable? I think, I think understanding these gaps 
you know, for most people that allow us to do a little better is probably where the payoff is. But you can't do that without understanding what is it that allows me, Greg, to think about your mind and make inferences about it in the first place. Well, I mean, there's a couple different ways that we could be bad at something or that we can make errors. I mean, one is that we're just, you know, we're just making errors a lot, right? Um, we're, we're just, um, you know, we're, we're just bad at it. And so just all there, over the place, yeah. we would have to think about, okay, what's the cost benefit associated with getting better at it? But another way to be wrong is to be wrong in a systematically biased way. And, and it seems like that, it's a little bit more difficult to, to explain that, right? It's, it's, it's easier to explain why, you know, maybe you're just generally bad at stuff, right? Uh, but but yeah, it's, harder it's, hard to explain, it's harder to explain why we would be bad in a, in a way that is, that is predictable, because one would expect that over time, you know, feedback w would lead us to uh, get back on, on track. So, yeah. Um, so, I mean, do you think of those differentially, right, as different sources of error? So, um, so the, the sources of error are typically the disconnect between how my mind is making sense of this complicated world and the reality that's being produced out there. Now, another person's mind is the most complicated thing you're ever going to think about, full stop. There's just not really a close comparison. It's a really, really hard problem to anticipate what somebody's thinking or feeling, how they might respond to a situation. Social cognition is just really hard. So there's going to be a lot of random noise. But um, it's also the case that the mechanisms that allow me to think about your, your, um, about your mind lead to some predictable errors. I tend to rely on my own mind as a starting point, and so I and if I can't tell how your mind differs from mine, I, I make a mistake where I assume your mind is more like my own than it actually is. Um, I look at your behavior and I work backwards if I can see you doing something, right? You're not talking to me and I have to guess, would you like to talk to me? I use your what I see from you as a guide. And if you don't seem interested, if you don't look interested, I assume you're not interested. And all of these mechanisms, all the, these processes really allow us to do better than chance, but they're imperfect. And to, and to get better, like to, to be able to, to get feedback that would calibrate us, you need a lot of feedback about that very problem repeatedly over time. I mean, learning is hard. If you've ever learned anything, it doesn't happen just one time, right? Like you don't, you know, you don't sit down and hear this great math lecture and suddenly, you know, have it down. You don't have one conversation with somebody and know how this is going to go. You don't, you know, propose to one person and, and have a, you know, have a marriage and get to practice that many times to figure out, you know, what's, what's, the, what's the best possible way to manage my marriage. A lot of things we do once, right? Take out a mortgage maybe a couple times. Get married to somebody, have kids a few times. So a lot of things we don't learn from. And then I think a bigger problem with a lot of, a lot of our social thinking is that, um, is that it, it can create reality, which then keeps us from getting the feedback we need. So, you know, Greg, if I thought you wanted to talk to me, I'd have, you know, have a conversation with you, and I'd figure out if that you know, assessment was right. Uh, if I decided, so I'd get feedback on that because I would approach you and would find out. If uh, we were in a coffee shop, I didn't think you want to talk to me or you didn't look very interesting, whatever, I decided, nah, I'm not going to have this conversation. Notice I wouldn't have anything to learn from. So when it comes to social thought, sometimes, particularly when it's about whether to engage with somebody to connect with somebody or not, our beliefs are self-fulfilling and they can keep us sometimes if we avoid other people from getting the feedback we'd need. Well, the methods that we use to understand ourselves are somewhat different from the methods that we use to understand others. And, you know, you talk in, in your work about how, you know, psychology went through this behavioralist period, right, where, you know, we, we just focused on kind of external um, stimuli and, and, uh, and, then, and then behavioral responses to it. Um, but, you know, when we think about ourselves, we, we have this deep and rich kind of understanding of, of the cognitive m mechanisms. And now we're more interested in that in the world of psychology. D does that dichotomy kind of re reflect the, 
dichotomy between how we understand ourselves and how we understand others? Yeah, a little bit. And although, although I will say that the, at least psychologists have claimed for, for decades, and I think this is right, that the actual processes we go through to reason about ourselves and to reason about others is kind of the same, but we do have different information about ourselves than we have about others. So if, if you know, I'm trying to figure out how nervous am I right now uh, doing this podcast, I've got both sort of how I'm, how I'm acting. Am I acting weird? I can kind of see that if I'm shaking or not. But I also have a feeling. I've got an internal experience I can consult. And, and how you interpret that in, internal experience is dependent a little bit on how you observe yourself too, right? So I, I've got a little more information about myself, both sort of what I can view of myself on the outside, but I've also got this internal experience. You just have what you can observe from the outside. If you knew that, you know, I told you I was feeling anxious or something or that I was a little jittery or I was feeling weird on the inside, if, you, if I could give you that access, you would use it to make an inference about me too, but you typically don't have that. You just judge me from, from the outside. And that difference in perspective can lead to some, you know, reliable misunderstandings too. I've got, I know how I'm feeling, like if, Let's go. Let's go back to the to the question about whether, you know, whether uh, whether I should should engage in a conversation with you if I see you just as a stranger in a coffee shop. I have I have my own sense of interest when I you know I kind of know whether I'm interested in talking with you. I got a bunch of internal signals on that, but when I look at you, all I have is the is the outside. Um, I don't have the inside, mm -hmm. uh, and that can that that's meaningfully different. It can create some gaps some perspective gaps. But, but even in that situation, I mean, we're, we're bad at forecasting the other person's reaction, but we're also kind of bad at forecasting our own reaction, right? So in some of your studies, you show that, you know, the idea of approaching a stranger and, and speaking with them, we underestimate how much we're going to enjoy it. We underestimate mm -hmm. how much they're going to enjoy it, right? Mm -hmm. So just across the mm -hmm. board, we, we tend to... Yeah underestimate the importance of, of pro-sociality, right? Why is that? Yeah, so I, I think these things are very tightly, tightly related. So the misunderstanding about ourselves and how much we're going to enjoy certain kinds of social experience stems mostly from misunderstanding how other people are likely, likely to respond. And this is, uh, so you mentioned the book MindWise that published in 2014, um, this work that I'll mention now is really the work we've been focused on and since that time. We did a, had done a little bit of work on this uh, that I talked about in the, in the book, but, but mostly this work is, has been since then. Um, and, I, and, and we got very interested in what just feels kind of like a, a fundamental paradox in human life, which is that we are inherently social agents. We are have a brain that's uniquely equipped for connecting with the minds of others. We're made happier and healthier by connecting with others. And yet, just, just look around a little bit. There are lots of opportunities to reach out and engage just from little things like walking down the hall and smiling and saying hello to people um, that we don't take to bigger things like you know sitting down and having a meaningful conversation with somebody over lunch or expressing gratitude when you feel it or or you know, doing something kind for somebody else when you have the opportunity, asking for help when you need it, just just on and on, lots of opportunities to reach out and engage with others that we we don't seem to take. And in in these cases over and over again, we find that people tend to underestimate how positively these interactions will go when you reach out, particularly one on one with somebody else, to connect with them in some sort of positive way. Um, and these gaps I think, come from a variety of different mechanisms. So one is that, as we talked a, a moment ago, my perspective and your perspective on me are, are different, right? So I, kn I know what I'm, what I'm thinking on the inside or feeling on the inside. I don't, I don't know that about you, and I have to, I have to guess or, or infer it. Um, out in the world in lots of places... If I'm making a decision about whether to come up and say hi to you or not, right? 
I have to read your interest, but I can't feel your interest. I can just see it from the outside. If you're not talking to me, it's easy for me to assume that you're not interested in talking to me because I just have your behavior to go on. And that can mean that you could get a whole bunch of people like we found on the trains in Chicago, for instance, who would be happier if they reached out and connected with other, other people, um, but thinking that other people didn't want to talk to them because nobody was actually talking. So Juliana Schroeder, your colleague at, at Berkeley, uh, my wonderful PhD student who's now on, on your faculty at Berkeley, we found this 10 or so years ago. And that's, that's a, a robust perspective, robust perspective gap. But there are others, others as well. Well, so that's, I mean, you talk about the, the tube chat, right? And uh, this was a, a uh, initiative that they did in London. And, and there was a reaction to, you know, don't even think about talking to me, yeah. uh, chat yeah. right? response. Yeah. But, yeah. but it seems to fly in the face of, you know, when I teach overconfidence in one of my classes, I talk about it in a couple different ways. One is sort of, you know, beliefs that have too much precision, right? Which is independent of content. But then there's this other kind of, um, overconfidence, which is that you, you think you're more attractive, you think you're more interesting, you, you know, you think you're, you're better looking than the, the average person. But this anti-sociability bias seems to go in the other direction, where you, you, you think that other people are going to find you uninteresting, right? You think that other people are going to be, be bothered by you. you, you other people are going to be more, more critical of you than they, they actually are. So, I mean, mm -hmm. how, do we, how do we reconcile those different observations about people's sense of their own self-worth? So I think the big thing to realize is that, that our under-sociality results are, are very context-specific. So let's just take something simple like having a conversation with a with a stranger out there in the world, you know, you sit down on a park bench. Somebody could, comes up and and sits down, you know, on the on the one on the other side of the sidewalk from you. You think about striking up a conversation, or as I do with all of our incoming MBA students here at Booth now, I have them all on their second day of their orientation sit down and have a deep conversation, deep and meaningful conversation with some other person they're just paired up randomly with somebody else in that room questions like um, um, what are you most grateful for in your life uh, tell me about it and um, you know when can you tell me about uh, when, when was the last time you cried one of the last times you cried in front of another person right now, now of course these the social cases, meaning social meaning of that is very different when you're, you're told to do it as opposed to you know the signal that you send when you initiate it right Maybe, maybe, although I don't, again, it's easy to imagine that, but again, the, the, again these are, these are context-specific. They, they mostly come out in, in, we see them in conversations or in interactions where you're reaching out and connecting to another person, and those situations are just extremely powerful, more powerful than, than we tend to anticipate. So conversation itself has a whole... Conversation itself is just an entirely cooperative process that tends to pull us together to some, to, uh, uh, with somebody else. So, you know, for us to have a conversation, we have to start by establishing some common ground each other, figure out what we're going to talk about. That's inherently cooperative. Um, we're going back and forth. We're taking turns. We're, we're cooperating, right? And cooperation tends to pull people together. Reciprocity is without question the dominant social norm in social interaction. So, you know, if I were to punch you in the face, you would probably punch me in the face back, right? That, that would be a bad, that'd be a bad interaction. But if I reach out and say hello to you, you know, with sort of authentic kindness, you tend to respond back in the same way. And it's those iterative social processes, those complicated social processes, that people tend to really underestimate the, the power of. So you're right. People tend to be overconfident in domains where task is pretty easy. If you get a uh, you know reasonable amount of feedback, um, it, you know not not a very hard hard task. But that kind of overconfidence is very context specific, and in contexts where there's a lot more going on than what we think, particularly stuff that tends to pull pull us together, like in conversations. Um, we, we actually underestimate how, how much those are, 
how well those are going to go. And again, it's not about us. It's not that we underestimate like how interesting necessarily we might be to other people. It's that we misread other other people, I think. We assume that other people aren't as interested in what I have to say as I am myself, and that could be uncomfortable. We assume that other people aren't so interested in talking to me unless we see a clear sign that we are. It's not that people misunderstand what talking to their friends is going to be like. We get that right. We got a lot of feedback on that. It's when there's some uncertainty that we tend to underestimate how well these are going to go. Now, is this really, I mean, is this driven by uh, an error in um, probability estimates or is it an, an error in um, the cost of false positives and false negatives? Right? In other words, if, if, if I'm thinking about talking yeah. to somebody, you know, they may or may not be interested and I could make a mistake, right? So I could, I could think they're interested yeah. and they're not, or I could not think they're interested and they are like, I could think they're going to yeah. respond positively and, and they don't and vice versa. And then there's going to be a cost, right? Of error. So yeah. if, if I, if they, if there's somebody who I could develop a relationship with and I forego it, that's going to have a cost. And if yeah. I come across as being rude and creepy and, <laughs> you know, yeah. har harassing yeah. and invasive, like that's going to come with a cost. So do we, do we, are we poorly calibrated on the probabilities or are we poorly calibrated on the cost or is, is, do, or are we well calibrated? I mean, is the, is the low probability that someone's going to be offended, you know, ha come with such a high cost that, that it, it makes sense for us to be cautious? Yeah. So let's, um, let's die, let's, let's get into the weeds on this a little bit. So, so, so we, we can be very precise about what these different mechanisms might produce in terms of findings. So, so one common interpretation and, you know, one we thought might be, might be possible is that um, folks are, are risk averse. And that is, you know, you, you know what the odds are, right? Like a, a take a 50-50 gamble. People don't take a 50-50 gamble 50% of the time. They take it less than 50% of the time because the, the thought of losing is just worse than the thought of gaining, and so people just avoid a 50-50 gamble. Yeah. So if someone reacts um, poorly, you're going to have such a – it's, it's going to be such a blow to your self-image or you're going to be overwhelmed with shame or regret. Well, that's a, that's a slightly different mechanism. So, so, so you asked about the probabilities. Are we off on the probabilities? Yeah. Risk aversion predicts that we're on we, – we get the probabilities right. And we just decide that the negative, that, you know, the negative interaction is going to be so bad, you know, that one bad one is going to be so much worse than the nine good ones. I don't want to do, I don't want to take a risk. Um, that's just not right. That is, pe people don't know the probabilities of these, mm -hmm. of, of the outcomes of these, these experiences that we look at least. So take, take, um, take the deep conversations uh, that I have my, my Booth MBA students do and lots of other people too. Be, you can do this at a party. It, it work, it's a super powerful effect. Um, um, we ask people to, we ask folks to predict, you know, what percentage of folks in that original experiment, we do this a few ways, some, but, but this is one. We, we can ask people, out of, out of 100 people who went through this conversation, how many on this 0 to 10 scale from I, I didn't enjoy it at all to I enjoyed it a lot, how many said zero? How many said one? How many said two? How many said three? And so on. You do that for the whole thing. And that way, and we can ask people to do it for others. We can ask people to do it for themselves. It kind of doesn't matter here, turns out. Um, the risk aversion story predicts that people will get those probabilities right. And they don't. They don't. They're not even close. Mm -hmm. the, it, almost nobody. Well, so out of, uh, what, 2,200 of these conversations that I've overseen now, um, there's nobody who gives us a, a zero on that. Um, that there's no, there they tend to be. There are a few that are that are not so great, right? Like two, three, four on that scale. There's some, but almost all of the almost all of the responses are at the you know at the five, kind of the middle of that scale, up to ten, and it just slopes up. The most common response is a ten. That was wonderful. But when we ask our students to tell us what those probabilities actually look like. They draw a much flatter line. In fact, almost, almost perfectly flat. Not, not exactly flat. I mean, if you put a marble on that line, it would roll towards zero. So they do recognize a few more people say 10 than zero. 
Um, but it's not close. It, it looks just like, well, I don't know, anything could happen. And it's just not right. It's not just not that anything could happen. There just is a lot of uncertainty. So it's not that people are getting the probabilities right and avoiding the low probability of a bad one. They genuinely don't seem to know and genuinely seem to think anything could happen. I don't know. You know, I could, I could ask Greg the last time he cried in front of another person, he could give me the middle finger and punch me in the face. Like that's, that's an option. Mm -hmm. it, it's not really an option, but that's what people seem, seem to guess or seem to think anyway. So I don't think it's risk aversion um, because people don't get the probabilities quite right. Is it adaptive? That's a, right. Is it, is it like somehow this uncertainty that we have or this, this anxiety about strangers is this adaptive? That, and that makes sense. Like I can tell that story. I, I can tell the story about how avoiding strangers is bad for us. It's just the data don't match it very well. Mm. So we've, for instance, we've known, we've known since 1980 that folks who are more extroverted are happier than folks who are more introverted. And those effects aren't small. Those are big, big effects. Um, and the correlations are in like the 0.5 range. Um, I mean, they're huge. They're huge. And if if being somewhat right withdrawn was better, we we didn't we wouldn't see a pattern like that. Um, if people even knew what what was kind of optimizing their well-being and you know extroverts like reaching out and connecting and introverts like keeping to themselves that makes then we'd expect no correlation we expect it to be flat because kind of everybody's picking what they want but that doesn't seem to be right and in more recent years the last couple decades it's become clear that extroverts experience more positive affect in their life because they act more extroverted well so That's then this it. is so, consistent with the asymmetric learning story right so to some degree e yes even if we were perfect Bayesian learners, we don't have enough data. So that would suggest that if you get people to do this, right, if you mm -hmm. encourage them or force them to start going out and being more interactive and doing more acts of random kindness, then this should lead to uh, yes. a feedback that would send them on yes. a different trajectory, right? Yes, yes, and it does, it does. Um, now the the feedback that the the learning has to be pretty narrow, but you know in, in, it it is the case that people do learn with a lot of exposure. So if we, so if you actually spend a lot of time, for instance, talking to your cab drivers, if you just do this, you will, I would predict, um, report that talking to your cab drivers is more enjoyable, would be more enjoyable than somebody who never talks to a cab driver. Right, because you've gotten some feedback, and most of those conversations look pretty well, go pretty well. We we did an experiment like that with folks. Juliana and I did uh, years ago with folks leaving on cabs from from Midway Airport. My favorite experiment on this, though, um, is one from is a more recent one. That's not my own. I, I wish it was. It's super fun. Um, one from Jillian Sandstrom, who's at uh, University of Essex in the UK. Erica Boothby, who's at Wharton, and Gus Cooney, who's who's also at Wharton. And what they did was they had people go out for a week and um, participate in a scavenger hunt. So every day they had, you know, they, well, they had, they had different tasks, social tasks, to go out and have conversations with people. And so the, the tasks were, uh, were things like um, nailed it. So find somebody with good fingernails and go have a conversation with them for a couple minutes. Or top hat, find somebody who's wearing a neat cap and go go talk to them. Or manscape, find somebody who's got a got a beard or a mustache and go have a conversation with them. Or things like inside, right? Find somebody who's inside and have a conversation. So they weren't all all specific, but they got you looking for people to have conversations with, right? And they did this repeatedly then over the course of the day. And it was narrow and focused, right? You're having multiple conversations with people, but it's just about conversations. And what they found is that so over deep. the so deep talk's better than small talk, but small talk is better than no talk, right? Yes, and that's actually the big effect. The really big effect is that small talk is better than no talk in a, in a given moment. Deep talk's a little better, uh, or not as bad as you might think it is. But you really, when, when you see people reporting that having a really deep conversation with somebody is better than a shallow one, it's typically when they have both and can compare them. 
Um, but, you know, on their own, the small talk is actually pretty, pretty good. And over the course of the week, what Jillian and, her, uh, and, and Erica and Gus found was that people became more calibrated in their expectations of how these conversations would go, how unlikely they were to be rejected, right, to find somebody that was uninterested. The only exception to this, interestingly, was, uh, was predicting how much they would enjoy it. That gap sort of remains. So I think you need a lot more experiences to learn that you're actually going to enjoy this new conversation with this new person. Um, but yeah, if you actually, you know, if you actually reached out and, and, and got experience, you would, you would get, you would get more calibrated at it. Yeah. Those, those yeah. mistakes would, would go away. So I think, I also think that that works a little bit against the hypothesis that somehow this is an adaptive thing for us, because when you actually get more experience, it doesn't make you more pe pessimistic. It makes you more optimistic and more calibrated. Well, I remember growing up as a kid, my, my, my dad was one of these people who would, you know, talk to the, talk to everybody, <laughs> you know, and yeah. I used to always be yeah. embarrassed be, to, to be with him because I, I, yep. I was like, why, why is he talking to the, all, all these strangers about random stuff? And what I failed to observe was how much those other folks actually enjoyed it and, and, and appreciated it, right? So, I mean, if we're going to do this learning. Presumably, we're going to be better at learning how we respond than how the, the others respond, right? In other words, we're not particularly good at uh, evaluating the, the, the internal states of the people we're, we're interacting with. Um, no, not great, although, although conversation does give us at least some information, right? So it gives us more than none. We would expect at the end of the conversation you to have some sense. Although, you know, in our experiments, um, yeah, pe you know, people can certainly report on how they're feeling, feeling about it. And the correlation between their guess about how the recipient feels and how the recipient actually feels isn't crushing, but there's also not a whole lot of range. Typically, at least in these conversations, they tend to be pretty good. Now, I want to make it crystal clear that this doesn't mean all conversations are good or that you don't find yourself sometimes in conversations you wish you didn't have. Of course you do, right? Of course you do. Um, it's just that our fears about how social engagement is going to go, particularly when it's positive, just tend to be a little off, a, a little overly pessimistic, in part because we don't seem to fully, I mean, this is one of the other mechanisms, we don't seem to fully appreciate that when you reach out positively to others, they tend to reach out positively to you in return. And people are, ha you know, happier to be seen and have somebody take some notice of them. That's just very powerful, surprisingly powerful. Well, the other thing you point out is that when you are interacting with others, you tend to overestimate the extent to which you will be evaluated on your competence and underestimate mm -hmm. the degree to which you'll be estimated, evaluated on your warmth. Yeah. But, of course, when you're evaluating others, warmth is, you know, yep. is, is, is critical. Thing. So yeah. wh why do we have that double standard? So this is another one of these perspective gaps that I think is really, really, um, really informative in explaining why we might fail to appreciate how somebody will evaluate a pro-social experience, a, a civil, positive social uh, uh, experience. Um, and I think that the perspective gap becomes pretty clear when you just think about what's on the minds of two people who are coming together. Right. So let, let's say, you know, Greg, I, I feel I feel grateful to you. I was a, st a student in your class and was you know, just really happy about, you know, everything that I learned from you. And <clears throat> and I'd like to let you know that this is, you know, we, we, the one thing we study in our experiments are expressing gratitude that tends to make people feel great. And yet that's the kind of thing. I mean, if you you sit down and think about somebody you're really grateful to and you think about sitting down and writing them a letter, um, Right. Yeah, I was just thinking the other day I should send a, I should send an email to my first economics professor who I haven't talked to in like <coughs> yeah, forty years right? and just say, Hey, you know, thanks. And why haven't you, right? Right. I know, you know right? But when you sit down and think about it, right, it, it does make makes well, it makes you a little nervous. Since right, there's there are all kinds of thoughts that come to your head. You feel good, but you know, is this the right time? Will this guy even care anymore? Um, you know, am I gonna get the words just right? You know, when you are an agent, when you're out there doing something you're focused on what you're doing and how am I going to do it? So it makes all the sense in the world that we 
when we're thinking about doing things ourselves, are focused on agency. You know, what we're doing, how well we're doing it, how intelligent we seem, and, and so on. Because we're trying to do this task. So we're going to be focused on how well we're doing this task. Other people, they're not, they're not focused on, on, on all of that. They're, they're, they're only judging us for what, for what they see. And what really stands out, what's of concern to us when we're looking at other people, when we're evaluating other people, is, is this somebody I want to want to hang around with or be with or be near? Is this person safe to be around, trustworthy, or should I just stay away? So for other people, that approach avoidance question, which is really about warmth, right? Is this person nice and decent and friendly, or, or should I stay away from this person? Is this dangerous? That's our when that's our what's top of mind for us when we're evaluating somebody else. And if we, you know, sitting down writing a letter to somebody are focused on our competency, or if we sitting down thinking about, you know, what happens if I say hello and, and smile at somebody else, have a conversation with somebody. If we're focused on our competency, what am I going to say? How am I going to write it? Am I going to be able to carry this conversation on? But other people are focusing on our warmth. When we're reaching out in these positive civil, sociable, pro-social ways that are all about warmth, right? We're, then we're going to be off because we're, we're using different lenses to look at this thing. We're focused on our competency. Other people are focused on our warmth. And these, these, these behaviors, because they're inherently about warmth, reaching out to others positively in ways that you connect, connect with them, um, it's going to be a source of misunderstanding. So, so even though we're, we're concerned about our, our competence, we, we tend to sometimes overestimate our own transparency. I mean, you, you know, you, you cite the, the, the Tapper uh, experiment, yeah. which I, I, I love, right? And when you're writing an email, you just assume that the people understand your tone, right? Or even yeah. when you're yeah. cracking a joke, you assume that people will know you're, you're telling a, a joke. So we, we sometimes tend to overestimate the extent to which others can, can see right through us. Yeah, and I think I think this is a this is a phenomenon to to go back to this this work we've been focused on so relentlessly on on under sociality, our tendency maybe to be not quite social enough for our own well being. Um, you know, th this can this can create some of these some of these barriers to reaching out and connecting with others. So it was one of the things, for instance, that Julia Juliana and I found kept folks from connecting we thought on the on the trains in Chicago and buses and cabs or in London because notice if you're sitting there you might be interested and open to making a new friend or you you know you 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 see somebody that that you've seen for a long time but you've never said hello to them right um, and you can be sitting there and and feeling that but once you're feeling that that you know, I'd be interested in engaging, or you know how you feel about this thing. You can assume it's it's also somewhat clear to other people. You you know, other people can tell. I'd be I'd be open to talking or visiting if other people wanted to. But you look at other people. You can look at somebody who's feeling the same way, but you don't have access to their minds. I don't have access to their thoughts. I can't actually see that, and so I assume that their behavior must be matching their mind, even though even though for me it's not it's not matching. I'd be happy to talk or engage or whatever, um, but I look at other people and I use their behavior as a guide to assume that they don't want to. If I think my own intentions are leaking out and it's crystal clear that I'd be happy to talk, well, then I can kind of conclude that I'm alone in that because nobody else is talking. That can create a phenomenon that psychologists refer to as pluralistic ignorance. You can get a plurality of people, a whole train load of people who would you know, be happier to talk rather than doom scrolling on their phone or whatever, but thinking that nobody else is interested. Um, and obviously they don't want to talk to me because I'm, I'm clear that I'm, I'm interested. Uh, you can get a whole bunch of people then not saying a thing. Well, and that's a, that's a coordination failure. And presumably it's a organizations can, can overcome that, right? So organizations can foster connections, can encourage connections through, through design, right? Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely, um, and and often what you do what you do to to short circuit this coordination problem is you is you get rid of the the choice part the expectation part, mm -hmm. right? And so you do like what I did, what I do to all of our incoming booth students. I organize an event where they're required to engage with each other, 
and I put them in a context where it's optimal for learning. I, I show them you know, how they think the conversation is going to go beforehand, and I show them how it actually went afterwards, and I don't just show them their, their responses, show them everybody's responses to this, everybody's having this, this experience together early on in their time here, and so hopefully it, it carries on down the road. Yes, organizations can design these things, um, mostly in ways that get around the expectations that we have that might be overly pessimistic. They just put people together in ways that allow them to interact with each other more often, and that helps to get around some of these issues. Now, you talk in the book about dehumanization of others, yeah. but you also talk about the humanization of, of um, material objects. Yeah. And uh, you, you, you talk about the MPFC and it, its role in, in this. Um, and so what kind of forms does this dehumanization take? So part of it is about stripping people of, of agency, but part of it's also about stripping them of context and failing to take into consideration the, the factors that would influence their behavior besides intention or, or preferences. Yep, yep. So, so there are a few different, um, few different forms this can take. And I, I, think of, I think of anthropomorphism and dehumanization as similar psychological processes just aimed yeah, it's at like a, It's like targets. a dial. It's like a dial that you, you, know, you, you can adjust yeah, up and, or down, and it, right? It, and the, yeah, the process that's involved here, the psychology that's involved here is about, I think in large part, about attributing a mind to something. And if we're thinking about another another person, dehumanization, at least one of the ways in which psychologists think about dehumanization, is failing to attribute a human-like mind to another person. And sometimes this sometimes this can be kind of thoughtful. Uh, sorry, sometimes this can be sort of subtle. Um, it can happen in in one of two ways. One is seeing somebody is just not that not that intellectually capable, like just not that not that sophisticated in their thinking. So if you think about why somebody who votes, you know, on the other side of the political spectrum votes as they do, my bet is the thought process that comes to mind is pretty simplistic, not that sophisticated, it's just not that thoughtful. Oh, they, they just go along with the lies anybody tells them. Right? So it might not be that it might not be that they're stupid. It might be that they're 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 mechanistic. Right there, it's an input-output yeah, right. system. Right, this is what's in their interest, and so they do it. Or this is what they hear, and so they do it. So you can, they're, it's, they're more predictable, in a way. Yes, yeah, that that could be true. Yes, that is true. Um, that is true, and uh, I'm not sure that it's. Uh, yeah, that that certainly could be true. Because I think you but, were saying so like if, the, if the Roomba if the Roomba were to follow a grid pattern, <laughs> a predictable grid pattern you would be less likely to anthropomorphize it. But when you see it kind of behaving in, a, in, in an unpredictable way, that's when you're yeah. more likely to attribute some, some agency to it, right? Yeah, so we can, we can back up again. We, want to, we, can be, we can be very specific about the processes involved here. One, one process is, 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 is what is it that triggers us to think that something might have a mind in the first place, right? And unpredictability is one thing that does that, right? If something behaves sort of randomly, it goes this way and that way, or, you know, sometimes you're tugging on your chin, other times you're not, right? Um, like if there's nature. some, yeah, that's right. If, exactly. If there's some variability, right? Some, some seemingly random variability, that's when we start to, to wonder, well, why is it doing what it's doing? And the way we tend to explain the behavior of others, what, what the, the convention that we've, we've stuck to is, um, is we tend to think about it in, in mental terms, in, in terms of mind. The thing's got a bit of a mind. And so when the Roomba goes all herky-jerky all around the room or, or when you've got this alarm clock that clocky that spins and moves all over different sorts of ways, um, that's when it starts to look like you know, maybe, maybe it's thinking. Like maybe it's got a plan. Maybe... And you try to try to figure it's got out a mind what's of going its own, on, right? That's the phrase it's got a we mind use. Of its own. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And that's whether this thing has a mind or not. And, and unpredictability can can trigger trigger these mind perception processes. But once we're thinking about you know what you know 
this 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 mind that this other thing has. We have to think about well, what kind of mind does it have? What what is it capable of? And that's where you can think about another agent as having a mind in two different ways. One is kind of thoughtful; it, it can think, right? It's, it's lights are on inside, and it can reason and, and be rational. Or it can be kind of dim, not that bright. Right, that's the that's what I was talking about with a political opponent. We might think it's just just not that sophisticated in the way, certainly not as sophisticated as I am in the way I think. Right, I'm aware of all of this careful processing I do, but you know the other side, eh, is not that bright. So thinking is one dimension. The other dimension is feeling. Um, that you know you might might assume that 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 somebody is is more or less capable to do things like you know feel feel empathy. Or secondary emotions like shame or guilt or, or pride. And the, that dimension is really about whether the person has strong emotional experiences or, or is kind of like a machine, just is kind of dead inside, no emotions. And you can anthropomorphize or dehumanize, you can attribute a mind to a human or, or non human on both of those dimensions, right? So you can be high or low on those, those two things. So our enemies, for instance, um, we often think of as, people tend to think of as kind of sharp and cunning, but just like sinister, just like heartless, unempathic, right? That's you know, the other side at, at, at war. Um, but, you know, children, like young kids, right? So you can also infantilize somebody, right? That's, a, that's kind of a, a version of dehumanization. Children are all emotion and no thought, right? That's another way you can, you could dehumanize a person is, Think of them just as not that, not that bright, even though they still have their emotional capacities. So this gets a little sophisticated, um, and uh, but 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 yes, people can do that both for non-human agents, attributing a mind to them on either of those dimensions, or on people just failing to perceive the full capacity of their minds on either of these dimensions. And so, the, to the extent that we dehumanize people, I mean, it's it's a function of psychological and, and physical distance right how similar mm -hmm. to us do we think they are yeah but then there's also an yep. element of 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 liking so i think you said when when you you know when you you like your roomba <laughs> you're, yep. you're more likely to attribute mind to it and if you're designing an autonomous vehicle y you want to do so in a way that makes you like them so if you can yep. get some kind of warmth in there then, yep. Then, yep. then you can uh uh you know make people think of it uh in a, in a more human way Yep, warmth and responsiveness, all of those things prompt you to think that this thing, you know, has lights on inside. It's actually thinking a little bit. Absolutely. Well, if we, I mean, if we, you didn't use the word empathy anywhere in, in, in the book, but I think that's part of what you're talking about when you talk about humanizing others. And, of course, a lot of people say that if you want to cultivate empathy, you need to um, put yourself in their shoes, right? And And, and, and you argue that well, putting yourself in someone's shoes <laughs> doesn't always work. In fact, it might actually go in the opposite direction and that y you need to do something a, a little bit more um, more difficult, right, to, yeah. to really get this empathy. I I've spoken to a lot of people and, and I've come to the belief that literature is very helpful. Um, you say ask people, right, just have them tell you. Sometimes they're not available, but... Through yep. literature, you can kind of inhabit the, the minds of people who are very different from yourself. How, how does, first of all, why does putting yourself in other people's shoes not always work? And, and so how can we cultivate this, this empathic capacity? So um, it's, it's important to clarify what we mean by empathy. And because the term itself is very fuzzy and used in lots of different ways that is not necessarily the way that psychologists would use it. And we're not always that as careful as I think we ought to be in how we use these terms. So empathy in the way we were just talking about it here has to do with accurate understanding. Do I really know what it's like to be you? It's, the, it's, the, it's kind of the root of empathy, this old German word, Einfalung, which is feeling into, feeling into another person and, and, and implicit in the feeling into is feeling into another person accurately. So if you are, if you are sad today, 
I know that you're sad and I, and I can, and I can, and I can sense and feel the intensity of your sadness. If you are happy today, I have a sense that you are happy and I can know and feel the intensity of that. If you are feeling regret about this thing, I can know and feel the intensity of, of that. But the, the key component here is, is knowing. I understand what it's like to be you. And I, can, I could anticipate your thoughts or your emotions or, or, or your behavior based on that. And um, the notion that perspective taking helps with, with empathy, uh, we don't use that term because in our, in our work that much because because the term is just so easy to misunderstand. But as long as we're focused on, on, on accuracy, when I put myself into your shoes, the presumption is that, that, that I'll bet it be better able to understand what it feels like to be you. I might be able to predict what you're likely to do next. If I, if I think about my wife, Jen, uh, you know, we've been married for 28 years. I'm trying to, trying to guess how she's feeling today. Well, I know what she's doing today. I could, I could imagine, right, I put myself in her shoes apparently, today. Apparently, you're not the best gift, gift giver. <laughs> you no, know, I'm not a perfect gift giver. That's, I, have, I have had plenty of errors. I, I don't, yes, I've got a different strategy for it now. Um, the presumption, though, is that if we do this, we'll get more accurate. I'll, I'll understand you better. And psychologists had, I think, just kind of taken that for granted for a long time. And, and studying accuracy is really hard. Um, it's much harder than understanding judgment. So if, so if I'm just a, running an experiment and, and Greg, I want to know how you think about something, well, I, just, I, just, I can just survey you I just ask you how you're thinking about something, and that's all I need to do. But if I want to understand how well you can guess what I'm thinking, say if I want to understand accuracy, how calibrated your social thought is, well, then i got to get you and i got to get me at the same time and right, get those two measures and, and crunch the number on the differences between them. And that's just hard to do. That's just practically speaking, it's hard to get pairs of people together to do research. And so psychologists had, had, had studied the, the act of perspective taking a lot, but had not studied whether putting yourself in somebody's shoes actually increases empathy in terms of accuracy or not. And when we did, we, we went into this research, this was about 10 years in the making, this, um, this, this project, this paper, which I talk about in the last chapter of MindWise, but we didn't publish it for another five years after, after the book came out. It took 10 years to put that thing together. We started thinking that, yeah, you, you know, we're, perspective taking increases accuracy. We thought there might be some moderators on this. That maybe it would be bigger in some cases than in others, the, the increase in accuracy. And we started running experiments on this, and we just weren't finding that effect at all. So we, you know, we brought married couples together and had them guess what their spouse was thinking about something and had like them the newlywed put themselves game, the, that old TV show. <laughs> yes. Yep. Like the newlywed game and have them guess what their spouse was thinking. And, and in the, the perspective taking condition was worse. They were worse than the folks in the control condition, not a lot worse, but a little worse. Um, and they were more confident like that. That's no, that's not right. They thought they'd done better engaging in perspective taking, but in fact, they'd objectively done a touch worse. Um, and we were finding this in other cases too. You put, put a picture of people up on the screen, you have to guess what emotion this person is feeling, put yourself in their shoes, trying to take on that emotion. People didn't get better. They got, if anything, slightly worse. Um, and we just kept finding this over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. And this, this paper actually has 25 experiments in it documenting just everything that we did you know, looking at contexts where most people, we had a separate survey of this, thought that perspective taking would increase accuracy, and it just didn't. Accuracy just didn't, and it, and it didn't, and it didn't, and it didn't, and it didn't over and over and over and over again. And the only thing that we found that actually incre increased people's ability to understand the mind of another person was asking them how they thought about something. That was it. Then like, like, <laughs> what, a, what a concept. Like, <laughs> yeah, like we, I, I, I have to say, I was super embarrassed about this. Like, this was this was an this experiment. Was headli we, the headlines, like, of, you know, the the obvious. Oh. Right? Yeah, <laughs> it's like right out of the somebody's onion, thinking. Right? Ask them what they're thinking, right? Ask them, ask them, idiot, right? Um, and we we referred to this when we first did it. As, you know, we'd run all these experiments, and we thought, is there anything we can do? to make people understand somebody better. Okay, well, so let's, let's compare it to the most 
obvious thing you could possibly do, ask somebody how their opinion about something, and then, you know, so they weren't giving you the number on the scale that you'd have to predict, but, you know, ask my wife, you know, to what extent do you feel we're too heavily in debt today? Uh, see what she says, and then, then I go predict how she'll answer that question on, on a survey, right? We referred to this for years as the stupid study, because it was just so obvious that this would increase accuracy, and it did, um, it did, but what was, what was particularly interesting about this is that, I think, is that as, as stupid and obvious as this solution is, the way you understand somebody else is when you actually become better at talking to them and listening to what they have to say about this thing, um, is that it wasn't obvious to the people who were doing it. So the folks in our experiments who are sitting down with their spouses, doing this task, predicting how their spouse would fill out this 20-item survey, when we asked them, how many of those items do you think you got right out of 20? And how confident are you in you know, how well you did on this task? We didn't see meaningful differences across those three conditions. And it's not, it's not always the case that people don't recognize that asking somebody the answer to a question is going to make them better. It's just that the, 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 whatever increase in, 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 in insight they think they've gotten just pales in comparison to the actual insight they got. They, they don't seem to realize which strategies are effective and which ones aren't. So to go back to your comment earlier um, in our conversation about overconfidence, in the perspective of taking in the control conditions in these experiments, people are wildly overconfident in the number of items, for instance, out of 20 that they get exactly right predicting how their spouse will feel on this seven, seven item scale. You know, they think they're getting 11 or 12 right when, in fact, they're barely better than chance getting about four right. Um, the folks in the, who, are, who are asking the other person are getting more like eight or nine out of 20 exactly right. But they don't feel like they're doing any better than folks in the control and the perspective-taking condition. So as obvious as it is to us that this is effective, it's not so effective maybe when you're actually doing it. Well, asking questions, I mean, is a, is a skill. You have to be good at it. Um, we should probably teach courses <laughs> in how to ask questions yeah. Yeah. In, in, in business school. Yeah. But yeah. One, one last topic. Um, most of the research that you've done is in the so-called weird countries, right? Yeah. And a lot of people are concerned about increasing isolation. A lot of people are, yeah. are concerned about dehumanization across different divides. Is this a pervasive human phenomenon or can we say something about different cultures perhaps different time periods uh, and if if so we know that companies can do things to or organizations or, or clubs or families can, can do things to alter the social dynamics to what yep. extent are these things that we're seeing in say contemporary america a, a product of beliefs that are specific to our to our culture and to what extent might they be a, a product of social rules or, or technologies that might be encouraging certain behaviors because you, you talk about how if something's easier people are going to do it <laughs> if something's harder th they're not going to do it and it it's, has less to do with their their beliefs and their and their motivations and, and more to do with the the environment in which they find themselves yeah, so this is, these are really hard questions to answer empirically. Obviously, we can't go into the past and find out what folks in the past did. Um, and, you know, going around the world um, is challenging to, to do as well because you obviously want to create similar situations that you can compare across contexts. But we're just starting to do this. And, and you can imagine two hypotheses here. And, and this is kind of what we're, we're testing testing between. If you just look around the world, um, you see different cultures. Let, let's just go to the sociality part that we talked about earlier. Because um, when you ask about, you know, whether cultures vary on some dimension or things vary over time, you have to ask about, well, what? Yeah, some things vary over time and some things probably don't. Some things vary around culture in an interesting way. Other things don't. When it comes to the sociality part, engaging with strangers or deep conversations, expressing gratitude or compliments and so on, there are meaningful 
cross-cultural differences, right? Different parts of the world behave differently. Um, some, some places are fairly outgoing, like the United States, fairly sociable. Other places are, are quite, um, or, you know, are, are, are not nearly as social, like the Scandinavian countries, for instance, uh, Sweden, Finland, Estonia, um, tend not to be as sociable um, as, as we are. And you can ask in, here in the United States, on average, and you can ask, do those cultural differences, do they stem from differences in people's expectations about how interactions might go? Right? So, you know, on the trains here in Chicago, nobody talks to anybody either here. That's a, that's a particular context. We think that's driven in part by their expectations that, that engaging with somebody here just isn't going to go very well. And, and I think they're, they're all, we're off on that some. So these culture differences could differ, differ in terms of expectations. They could also differ in terms of experiences. Some, some places may have people who are just, in fact, happier engaging with others um, or happier keeping to themselves. The, the Finns may just be happy keeping to themselves. They may just enjoy their quiet time. Um, and the answer at this point is we don't, we don't know which of those is going on. Um, I will say, though, that my, my, my hypothesis, at least, what, what I think is my, my prediction is that these, these differences across time and place and context is likely to, to vary a lot by people's expectations in that moment. That's what we're likely to see varying, not so much the experience of social engagement. So if you just look across daily life here in the U.S., right, there are some places where we, we engage with people right away, right? You get together at a networking event, and you'll talk to anybody because that's what you do there, right? That's what's expected. You know everybody expects that. You know everybody's there to talk, so that's what happens. Um, on a plane or a cab or a bus, well, you're not so sure, and so you'll keep, keep quiet. Um, those, are, those are your expectations driving those behaviors, I think, more than your experiences. So that's what I would expect to see around the world, but we don't know. Um, as to whether this is something relatively new, I do think um, certainly the fact that we all carry around with us these tools of distraction, right, these, these smartphones that have the world's information on them, I think that keeps us from just paying attention to what's going around, on around us a lot. There's a lot of good evidence for that. Um, there's really interesting research by Liz, Liz Dunn, who's at UBC, University of British Columbia. Um, when, if you've got your cell phone out on the table at a dinner with friends, you enjoy it less than if your cell phone is in a basket in a way because you're just attending less to the people around you. I think that happens a lot. You're just then not attending. To, you're not looking for people who might be interested in engaging with you or talking with you or connecting with you. I think that certainly happens. At the same time, the phone can keep us connected to friends and family, so um, that certainly can happen, happen as well. But I think out in the world, it's probably a reasonable bet that, that these phones are keeping us a little more disconnected probably than we used to be. Now, in the world of business education, uh, how, how important should the sharpening of social intelligence be in the curriculum right, and calibrating one's understanding of others and if if it is important should it be part of the curriculum or should it be more co-curricular in other words can you you know you shape the, the the social environment to develop these skills um and then the other question is why do we have to wait till business school <laughs> could you maybe as a, as a parent or as a someone who's in the education at uh, earlier stage start to think about cultivating these these traits um, as a more central part of the educational process. Yeah, so, um, okay. Let, so I, I teach a class here at the University of Chicago, uh, an ethics class called Designing a Good Life. And the course is essentially based on the assumption that you that all of us kind of want the same thing out of our lives. We'd like to live a, a good life in multiple is this senses. An, is this an elective or, or a core it is an elective. We don't really have here at the University of Chicago, we, we, we don't have core classes that everybody, or we don't have many, that everybody has to take, just a, a couple. So pretty much everything's an elective. Um, students tend to like the, like the course, though. They want to, generally want to take it. Um, but 
it's based on the assumption you want to live a good life in three senses of the term. You'd like to like to do well at work. You'd like to be good at your job and, and succeed at work and business. You'd like to succeed in a way that you can be proud of, that you feel good about, that's ethical. You'd like to be ethical. And third, you'd like to feel good, right? You'd like to be happy in your life. And it turns out these three things in the long run um, generally are aligned with each other. And I spend a lot of time actually at the end of class investigating with the students having them do some of these experiments that we've talked about, investigating whether doing good tends to feel good. Doing, doing, doing well at work, being ethical at work, tends to be good for, for business in the long run. You can only cheat for so long before everybody hates you, nobody wants to work with you. Um, but doing good also tends to feel good, tends to be associated with happiness and well-being. And so I think, I think if you're going to run a sustainable organization, Understanding how sociality and pro-sociality, doing the things that connect us meaningfully with others, most of that stuff that's aligned with treating other people well and hence is aligned with ethics. Understanding how important that is for coordination and cooperation within a business and also for people's happiness, they're, they're just how good they feel on the job makes it a central priority in any organization. Ethics isn't just being good for its own sake. It's, it's good leadership because it leads to doing better in the long run. You get an organization where people want to work, they want to work hard, they like each other, they get along well, it's more sustainable in the long run, um, and they're just, they just feel good. They come, come to work happier each day, more interested in working, and that's exactly the kind of organizations that most of us would want to run. And I think we can do that both curricularly, so in, in classes like, like mine, but the way it's really powerful is in the extracurricular stuff when you, when you can feel it. So, right, lots of social events um, are organized around to do that. But the one thing that I think is, that is powerful here is we kind of combine these things a little bit in our orientation session. Um, when I collect data about their expectations and their experiences at the same time while they're in the midst of doing this and show it to them, at the same time. So we're sort of combining the curricular and the extracurricular into the same thing in a way that really works well for learning, I think. Um, in terms of, you know, younger, when kids are, are younger, there's a lot, of, um, a lot of efforts to try to in, in, increase kids' socio-emotional competency. Um, I think most of that, though, is focused on focused on, you know, like competence um, as, a, as a skill, and a little less on just kind of morality. This is part of what it means to be a good, decent person that will then lead to a happier and healthier life as well. That dimension of this isn't focused on, I think, as much. I'd love to see it. I'd love to see it worked into schools. We are in the process of talking with folks about running this in some school settings. I did a gratitude exercise in a high school one time, which was really great, really powerful. 350 high school kids did this, mostly writing letters to their moms. Um, and I, I think this is definitely something we could weave more into our upbringing, make us better people uh, and make us happier as we go along too. Well, the word wisdom pops up every now and then <laughs> in your work. Yeah. And I know your yeah. uh, mentor, Tom Gilovich, wrote a book uh, with that word in the title. And I think a lot mm -hmm. of your work is definitely contributing to a modern wisdom literature. So, Nick, thanks so much mm -hmm. for, for joining me. Really appreciate it. And uh, hope to see you uh, on campus sometime soon. Absolutely, Greg. Berkeley's a lovely place to visit, particularly in the wintertime. Unsiloed Podcast is produced by University FM, elevating the stories of your institution 